So today is Good Friday and it is a good day. It is the day that we remember the pain and suffering of our God who loved you too much to leave you behind, who relentlessly pursued you to the point of death on a cross and he pursues you still. He's always knocking. He's always calling you. The question is this morning, are you ready? This morning, wherever you are, are you listening? Because he has something he wants to say to you. This morning, my prayer is that today would not just be another Good Friday to throw away, but a day that God speaks directly to you about what comes next. A day that you would say yes to what Jesus has for you. And today is all about what's going to happen on the way. Today, on the way to wherever you're headed after this moment, today you have a choice to make. Today, you came here with a plan, and perhaps your plan sounds a little bit like this. I'm a good Christian, and it's Good Friday. I'm going to go to church at extra time this week, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to feel good about that, and then I'm going to go to my family barbecue, and that's going to be great. Or today, I'm going to go off on my family holiday, and that's going to be great. Or perhaps those plans unraveled this week because maybe you're joining us at home online in COVID ISO. Maybe your plans are to go and jump on Netflix after this. Hey, I just want to let you know I see you and I, I know you've got plans. And maybe today your plans got interrupted. Maybe your plans were honestly that you were going to sleep in on this Good Friday public holiday. And then you had a mother, a friend, a brother who said, hey, come and join me in the room. Come and join me online for Good Friday. You said, okay, and now you're thinking, I don't know what I said that for. Maybe now you're feeling uncomfortable. Maybe now your plan is to get out of this situation as soon as you can. Hey, I just want you to know I see you and I have been you. I know you've got plans. And today, no matter where you are, you've got plans past today. You've got plans for next week. You've got plans for next year. You might not even be aware that you have plans, but you do. Perhaps your plans are you're going to get through this excellent public holiday season and get back to that nine to five grind as normal. Maybe you're going to get back to family as normal. Maybe it's family that looks dysfunctional as normal. Maybe it's studies at uni for your future as normal. Perhaps it's back to your normal hopes and dreams. Maybe they include one day getting married. Oh, yes. Maybe they include one day owning a house. Maybe owning a second house. Oh, yes. They are good dreams. Maybe one day your plan is to leave your job and get a new one. Maybe you've got a plan to leave your current partner and get a new one. Maybe this season is hard for you. Maybe you had plans, but you don't know what happened to them. And you want new plans, but right now you've just got to get through this period of trial and grief. We've all got plans. We're all on our way to somewhere this morning. And if you're honest with yourself, this moment right here, this Good Friday morning where we're remembering the sacrifice of Jesus It has the potential to just be a stop on the way to somewhere else, on the way to somewhere better, on the way to somewhere more exciting, on the way to somewhere more fulfilling. Only I think we all know when you live long enough, you eventually get to that place with the spouse, with the house, with the new job, whatever it is. And we have to come up with new dreams because what we expected to complete us didn't come Plead us. All of our earthly plans, all of our worldly desires, all of the things that we distract ourselves with ultimately come to nothing if we get there without Jesus leading us there. So today, you have a very important choice to make. Today, on the way to wherever your plans are leading you next, you can choose to let this moment pass you by and get on with your plans. Or you can allow what happens on the way today and this moment right here to transform you. Allow what happens on the way today to transform you and change you forever. Today we've all got plans. But today, Jesus is asking you 
to take them in hand and to lay them all down. Be interrupted. Have your trajectory changed because Jesus has better for you. In the midst of your own plans and desires this morning, would you allow what happens on the way to transform you today? Well, let me read you the story of someone else's life who was forever changed on that first good Friday as he was on the way to somewhere else entirely. In Mark 15, 16 to 21, we can read, the soldiers took Jesus into the headquarters of the governor's compound and summoned a military unit of nearly 600 men. They placed a purple robe on him to make fun of him. Then they braided a victor's crown, a wreath made of thorns, and set it on his head. And with a mock salute, they repeatedly cried out, Hail, your majesty, king of the Jews. They spit in his face and they hit him repeatedly on his head with a reed staff, driving the crown of thorns deep into his brow. They knelt down before him in mockery, pretending to pay him homage. When they finished ridiculing him, they took off the purple robe, put his own clothes back on him, and led him away to be crucified. As they came out of the city, they stopped an African man named Simon, a native of Libya. He was passing by, just coming in from the countryside with his two sons, Alexander and Rufus, and the soldiers forced him to carry the heavy cross beam for Jesus. And we know from reading on that Jesus was nailed to that cross and he did, in fact, die. He didn't stay that way, but he did die. And someone who was there on the way that day was this man, Simon, often called Simon of Cyrene in other translations, and his two sons, Alexander and Rufus. Now, Simon had been travelling with his family from Libya, Libya, which is in the north of Africa, to get to Jerusalem to celebrate the most important celebration of the Jewish calendar. It was Passover. It's when they remembered that once they had been slaves in Egypt and now they were free. Once there had been no way and then God had made a way for those people. It was a big deal. It was exciting. And if Simon and his family had been walking every day for eight hours a day during that time, it would have taken him at least 32 days to have arrived in Jerusalem this day. So here they are having just arrived, just come in from the country, and then something happens on the way. There's this man, and he's beaten and he's bloody, and the Roman soldiers around him, they're getting pretty worried, because clearly this man is on his way to be crucified, but clearly he can't carry that cross on his own, and the crowd is growing angrier, and the crowd is growing louder. Now, Roman law said that any soldier had permission to conscript a non-citizen to carry their burdens for them for one mile. And that person had no choice. They just had to do it. And by the way, in Matthew 5:41, when Jesus says to us, whoever forces you to go one mile, go with them too. This is the law he was referring to. And so a Roman soldier turns to Simon, picks him out and says, you carry this cross up to Skull Hill right now. And Simon had no choice. I mean, it was bad. But it was far worse than the fact that he had to carry a 134 kilo cross through Jerusalem. Like, that's pretty bad. And it was far worse than that the crowd being angry around him, humiliating him as he is helping this criminal. Like, that's bad too. But by far the worst thing was that this cross was covered in blood. Both the blood of old criminals who'd been crucified on it before him, they didn't use new crosses, and also Jesus' current blood, this man who Simon did not know, but for who for some reason the soldiers had decided to lacerate to a bloody pulp. Now, according to Jewish law, touching that cross made Simon unclean for seven days. I think some of us might know how this feels, to suddenly get a test result and all of a sudden all your plans go out the window for seven days. Even though he's travelled all this way, even though he's had so much expectation and so much planning, the one thing that he's come to Jerusalem for, the Passover, out the window. The thing that interrupted him on his way sucked. I think you know how this feels. The anger, the disappointment, the unfairness of it all. You can imagine Simon, he finally reaches Skull Hill, he throws down that cross and he hightails it out of there, probably to the nearest 
bath. And you can imagine him, just like so many of us, when we have had to endure a COVID lockdown, like maybe some of us are joining us at home, or maybe some of you in this room who feel a little bit like you've been dragged here against your will, you can imagine Simon at this point feeling cranky and annoyed. He's keen to move past this interruption, and he's keen for life to go back to normal, his plans as normal. Except that's not what happened. At some point on the way, as Simon hightailed it out of there, he traded in his disappointment and his anger and his cynicism. He traded it in for curiosity. At some point, I think he asked some of these questions. I wonder who that guy was. Like, did he really deserve to be treated that badly? And why was God's name, Yahweh, written above his head like it was some sort of crime? And at some point on the way, that curiosity, it turned into awe and wonder as he got some of these answers. What? He, he performed what miracles? Hey, wait, and you were there? You saw it? No. Wait, and what did he say to the religious leaders? He didn't. Oh, it's no wonder that they crucified him. Wait, and, and, and what did he say about God's coming kingdom? That it's here and yet not yet. And it's starting now. Wait, wait, what do you mean you just saw him? I, I saw him crucified three days ago. And at some point, that awe and that wonder that led to transformation. And we know this because his son Rufus was an important member of the first church in Rome. He is mentioned by Paul in a letter to that church some 30 years later. In Romans 16, 13, we read, Greet Rufus, for he is especially chosen by the Lord. And I greet his mother, who was like a mother to me. I love this because it's transformation, not just of one man, not just of his wife, but of a whole generation that began to lead a church, that began to change a nation whose legacy went on, taking the life-changing message of love that God proved to us on a cross, taking it across borders and across time with a message to the world to wake us up that life as it is, is not how it has to be, that the way I live my life doesn't have to be about me, and we can all choose to walk in it because Christ sets us free. You know, before I was a Christian, I'm going to be honest, I was a selfish manipulator and a ruthless liar, willing to do whatever I needed to do to get my way. And I was lost in the baggage that comes from being a middle-ish child in a large family that endured several divorces and changing step-parents as I grew up. I loathed Christians. I hated Jesus. And I was so cynical about church. And wherever I was on my way to, it definitely wasn't here. And then against my will, God called me. And against my better judgment, he moved me again and again. I felt it as I sat through church service after church service until one day the Holy Spirit rose up in me in such a way that I could not say no anymore. On my way, God helped me to step out. And then he stepped up, leading me in a new direction, a direction of healing and forgiveness, leading me in a better way, leading me to let go of my plans and to let God, allowing his love to renew my mind. I'm not the same person that I was. And look, I have seen dark days. I have been up in the middle of the night crying on my bathroom floor for some of the grief-stricken situations that I've had to live through. And yet God's love has never left me. 
and I've seen demonstrations of his miraculous power. Yes, he is too good not to believe. I have seen physical healings and I have seen him work in physical situations where there was no other way forward and he made a way. And I am far from perfect and he will never be done with me. But day by day, he is leading me in a new direction. In Jesus, there is hope. In Jesus, there is freedom. In Jesus, there is power. There is transformation and there is purpose for you. There is a new dawn for your life if you would just trust him with it. Today, there is a better way. And so... You have a choice to make on the way to wherever you might have been going today. In this moment, right here at the foot of the cross on Good Friday, you have your life behind you as it was and a decision before you. Do we let the disruption of Good Friday just pass us by. Or, as we remember Jesus' sacrifice, do we, like Simon, draw near to the broken body and blood of Jesus and acknowledge a love for us that we will never fully understand? Do we take a moment to lay aside whatever else we may be tempted to think about right now? And do we let our curiosity take over as we eat and drink? What does it really mean that my God loved me this much? What does it mean that there is nothing that I could ever do to deserve that. Let's eat. What does it mean? for me to take my plans in hand and really lay them down? What does it look like to say yes to what Jesus has planned for me? To go in the direction that he wants me to go? To be transformed? Let's drink. What does it look like to be really transformed by Jesus today? It is my sincerest prayer that on the way today, God had something to say to you. I believe he did. Maybe it was a picture. Maybe a person to reach out to and forgive. Maybe a new blog to write business to start or leave, maybe a relationship that needs a bit more work, maybe he had a specific word for you, courage, courage, whatever it is that God said to you today, I would ask you not to leave here today without telling somebody about that, a trusted friend or a mentor, maybe if you're at home you can ring a friend or a mentor. And if you want to come down the front after the service, I would, I would actually love to pray with you. But we're going to have a moment right now. And this moment is for people who have been spoken to in a very particular way during this service this morning. We're going to have a moment right now where if today God said to you, hey, today is your day. Hey, today is your day to say yes to me for the first time or the first time in a long time. This is your moment. So what I'm going to ask is for all of us to close our eyes and to bow our heads to create a moment of privacy. And if that's you 
this morning, if you know that that's you, for the first time or for the first time in a long time, you know Jesus is saying, today is the day, say yes to me, that I'm going to ask you to have courage and to put your hand up so that I can see it, just me, so that I know who I'm praying for. Now is your moment. Don't let it pass you. Yes, I see that hand. I see that hand. Thank you for your courage. God's going to work through you today. I see that hand. Thank you for your courage. God's going to work through you today. He's got something to say for you today. He's got plans for you today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for these decisions in the room. I see that hand. Let's put our hands down. Let's open our eyes. And let us celebrate together these three hands that went up in the room this morning. Maybe more hands online. If that was you online, go ahead and write yes in the chat and join us as we courageously say this prayer together. No one prays alone. Let's say this life-changing prayer together. We're going to say, Jesus, this is my decision. Today, I say yes to you. You died on the cross to pay the price for my sin. I invite you to be my saviour. Come into my life. Forgive my sin. And fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit. 